Welcome to the CNCF on-demand webinar, Reduce the Carbon Footprint of Your Cloud-Native Workloads Now. I'm Robert Duffner from the product team at IT Renew. Today, we welcome Andy Randall, Chief Commercial Officer at Kinvolt, and Eric Rydell, Senior VP of Engineering of IT Renew. At the end of the discussion, we will answer some questions, so please stay with us. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric to get the discussion going. All right, thanks, thanks Robert, uh, for the introduction. Um, thanks, uh, Andy, for uh, for joining us for the uh, the webinar. Um, what we want to uh, talk to about today is a topic maybe doesn't come up that often um, in uh, in CNCF circles is um, the interaction with the hardware that underlies um, all of the the infrastructure um, that uh, that CNCF and and the world um, builds on from day to day. Um, luckily for most people, uh, you don't have to worry about your your hardware because there's there's those of us um, in our corners of the industry that are taking care of uh, of what lies underneath. Um, and um, occasionally, we just like to surface a little bit of of what we're doing. And our focus today, um, based on some of the the Sesame products um, that we have um, at IT Renew, is focusing in this week of of Earth Day. Um, on the carbon footprint that uh, that that code um, provides, or sorry, that that hardware provides, um, as well as how it interacts with the large scale uh, ecosystem. So that's that's why um, we asked um, Andy to join us, um, longtime uh, software open source uh, advocate and and implementer, and and so hopefully we'll outline how uh, openness applies to hardware as well as it does to software, and how all of it can be used to to be more efficient, uh, more efficient in in the software and the systems and the applications, and more efficient in the way that we provide and produce uh, the hardware uh, underneath. So Andy, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, Kinvoke and the, the software infrastructure? So we'll start at the top and, and work our way down to the hardware. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, the first thing to point out is, um, you know, when we, built, when we thought about how do we build this solution, we wanted it to be open from top to bottom. So it's an open hardware architecture and an open software uh, architecture. And, you know, um, IT Renew and Kinfolk have really collaborate to get together as a team uh, to deliver this. And that kind of goes back to some of the founding principles that Kinfolk was established on uh, over five years ago now, right at the beginning of the cloud native revolution. Uh, we, we started with a team that had a lot of expertise in uh, Linux, a lot of the low layer, uh, low level uh, layers of the, of the cloud native stack and you know, built on that with container technologies and Kubernetes expertise as well. Um, the, the kind of values that we set up the company around were all around open source, so contributing, cooperating, community, welcoming. And this kind of embodies both how we work with IT Renew to deliver the open systems um, that we're going to talk about more, as well as how we want to work with the users, with the uh, customer community, and uh, other vendors and partners out, in, out there. So, um, you know, so that's kind of a little bit of how we at Kinfolk think about things. And, and we take this expertise, we take these values, and kind of the direction we're pushing in is all around how do we build an, a truly enterprise grade cloud native stack for deploying applications that's 100% open source and community driven. Um, of course, we base this around Kubernetes and we put a lot of other software together with that, and we do integration with the hardware systems, and that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of the uh, session today. Beautiful, yeah, thanks, thanks, Andy. So, so just to, to briefly introduce, IT Renew um, as a company has been around almost 20 years, um, but Sesame um, as a, a line of, of rack integrated server storage and networking is, is a little bit more than two years old. So, so we're we're a little bit uh, on the on the startup phase, but building on a on an established base, right? Um, and and the other thing that um, that we're building on, you know, similar to the you know the community of of CNCF and the community of Linux that um, that so much of our of our software is based on, is the um, the Open Compute project, right? 
And the, the Open Compute project is just under uh, 10 years old, um, was, um, was originally started by Facebook. There were other um, hyperscalers um, before, you know, most notably Google, Amazon, that had started innovating in, in hardware kind of on their own. And then um, Facebook and, and a number of others, you know, Arista and, um, and, a, and a set of small set of vendors were responsible for bringing that into the open, right? And saying, hey, can we do hardware innovation in the same ways that we do software innovation, right? Um, we already collaborate uh, globally, right? The hardware um, industry is global um, in, its, uh, in its implementation. Um, lots of dependencies, lots of supply chain that uh, that we've seen um, recently. You know, certainly pluses and minuses. But this is how we've um, we've built the industry, right, with global and and worldwide collaboration. But but we was often being done in a in a one on one or a, a one on a few um, small number of vendors, right. Um, I personally uh, spent nine of the last 10 years at, uh, at EMC and then Dell um, after the merger. We did lots of collaborations with a lots, lots of vendors and, and different hardware partners, different software partners, um, but it was often done in, in the service of our ultimately proprietary platforms. Right? And, and so what Open Compute does is it brings uh, that community explicitly um, into the open. And what you see in the in the visual um, that I have up, there's a there's a huge breadth um, of projects that over the last uh, nine years um, that that community has been able to uh, to bring together. So there's there's over a hundred um, active projects, um, nearly two hundred projects um, all told, and they span a, a very wide dynamic range of um, of hardware um, and and related systems, right? All the way from from data center facilities. So this is literally about the physical infrastructure, the concrete and the the pipes and the um, cooling and so on of of data center infrastructure, where the teams have been able to innovate in in incredible ways um, to bring um, efficiency uh, way down. Right, any um, amount of of electricity and water um, that is wasted um, cooling or um, otherwise um, kind of managing the data center could better be applied to the actual computing. Right, and so there's a number of metrics there that have been uh, much reduced um, from um, you know 30 and and 40 percent overhead to sometimes four and five percent um, overheads today that data centers are able to provide. Similarly, in terms of, of server innovation, um, this rethinking, um, again, starting um, you know, nine years ago, sometimes longer um, with some of the other hyperscale vendors of what is really necessary um, inside a server, um, what is um, core and, and what is context. And, and there's sim similar design simplifications that have taken place um, over that time frame. Right, that reduce the total number of components, which makes the system simpler, but as a side effect also makes it more reliable. If there's less components, there's less components that fail, makes it more efficient. And right? if there's a smaller number of, of larger components, then there can be um, a greater mechanical and a greater electrical efficiency. For example, we use larger fans that move a larger volume of air for the same amount of, of input electrons. We use larger power supplies that have less uh, waste um, in their conversion factors, right? And so all of those are, are multiple, end up being multiplicative effects to both the server specific design and uh, the rack uh, and power design. And the final thing I wanna mention while, um, while we have this, this visual up is you'll notice that open compute includes not just uh, hardware vendors um, in the list, Right, um, Intel, um, WeWin, um, Quanta, uh, et cetera, Arista, but also um, end user companies such as Facebook, um, AT&T, um, Microsoft, um, and other component vendors, right? You see Edge Core, Delta Electronics. And so we're really bringing to the table the component vendors, right? Those who design the power supplies and know more about the power supply than, uh, than, than you ever really wanted to know the system integrators who are bringing those together into, into operational systems, um, and then the end users who are like, this is how it, it actually operates in the data center. And so that has been incredibly powerful um, for us um, in the hardware space, as I would assume is, is very similar in the, in the software space, Andy. 
Yeah, absolutely, Eric. I mean, I, th I think if you look at the velocity that the cloud native community has moved at over the last few years, it wouldn't have been possible in a proprietary world. I mean, it's all a result of the kind of collaborations that we see between vendors you know, and end users all coming together, working in the open. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then and just uh, to, to nod to the, the worldwide aspect of, of what we're doing. So uh, so Robert is uh, is in California in Silicon Valley. Um, I'm actually um, in a in a, a seaside town uh, south of uh, of Boston. Um, and Andy is in uh, in Germany in uh, in Berlin and the met metropolis there. So exactly. we're even this this webinar um, is in its production um, global. And of course, um, the audience will be, you know, likely in, uh, you know, in, in every time zone um, around the world, and um, and that's that's really provided us a lot of uh, a lot of power and um, and synchronicity there. All right, so let me let me talk a little bit about um, then the hardware um, footprints um, that uh, that underlie what we're doing here. Right. So I, I've given the backdrop of of open compute designs. So what we're showing now um, in the visual is is a couple of the solutions um, from from IT Renew, and um, and if you start in the center, so in the center what we have is is an integrated Sesame rack, storage compute. Um, networking as it's ready to ship um, to uh, to one of our customers, and, and so we have a mix of compute nodes and storage nodes, so that different workloads can use different um, aspects of the system. Right? Um, well, when we when we then add the the Kubernetes, the container orchestration system, then uh, customers are able to get exactly the same type of flexibility that they're used to in now the public cloud. Um, with which has you know exactly the same hardware underneath, right? There's there's lots of servers in in serverless, no matter how you do it. Um, but what what we're able to provide at the design level is um, that type of flexibility. Right? And so when we work with our customers, we ask how, how many containers are you going to run, um, how many cores, how much networking bandwidth, and so on, and then we'll take care of fitting that um, into a rack. As you see um, in the center here, um, there's a rack with um, with about a dozen nodes and um, and some high density storage um, at the very bottom of the rack. And then what you see on the right hand side is a three rack um, build out that is actually um, one part of a build out that we're doing together with with a customer a partner um, block heating um, in Amsterdam. So those three racks are um, part of an 18 rack. Uh, footprint um, that that block heating is using um, to um, to manage a, a, a computing infrastructure, but then they're they're doing a, a second benefit um, in that they're using the exhaust heat, the waste heat from those racks, from the CPUs in those racks, to heat up water, which then heats up their greenhouses, which is shown in the bottom. So not only um, do we use the um, the hardware for um, cost efficient, uh, energy efficient uh, computing, but then the the waste heat that is generated, right? Conservation of of energy. So every electron that uh, that goes in as as power um, has to be exhausted as heat. We use that heat again, or block heating uses that heat again to uh, to warm up their greenhouses and um, and grow tomatoes. So we're, we're really making use of not just we've taken the efficiency of the hardware um, to the um, kind of the ultimate level, but we've also um, made additional use uh, in this case of the, um, the energy that's, uh, that's dissipated, right? And then finally, um, on the, um, the left-hand side um, is a, a desk side unit. Um, so this is something that um, has been um, quite uh, popular for, for our engineers and, and for some of our customers um, during the pandemic. So this is a way to have a four or five node hyperscale cluster under your desk. So this unit um, plugs into a standard 110 um, electrical outlet, um, sits underneath your desk, and has exactly the same uh, nodes as would be found in the rack. So we use this, our engineers use this um, to design and develop uh, the systems. Um, and we, um, our customers use this to, to do benchmarking and, um, and POCs. It also um, gives many of our customers a sense of what's possible in reimagining the footprint of computing. 
So there's a number of designs I won't go into um, in this uh, discussion, but for edge computing in, in all different types of, of wiring closets or, or the corner of a, of a mall or um, a, a real estate uh, scenario or a manufacturing facility where it really makes sense to not bring an entire rack, but maybe three nodes, four nodes, five nodes, but then there is a hundred or a thousand locations. So imagine a retail customer with a thousand physical stores, each store has three or four servers, and they wanna treat that as a 3000 to 5000 node Kubernetes cluster, because it really is globally distributed, has a, a global workload, uh, needs um, kind of orchestration and monitoring just as um, a data center infrastructure does, but now it's, it's widely distributed. And, and we're with our capabilities of, of reimagining the hardware, we're able to, um, to bring that to bear. And just because you were talking about global there, Eric, it's not just available with 110 volts. It'll, there's also a 230 or 240 volt option, right? That, that that's right, Andy. Thanks for the for the reminder. The 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 crate, the box, in fact, um, comes with um, with two cables. So uh, the same uh, the same power supply um, can be um, can also be used in uh, in, in two hundred and twenty volt uh, companies. Um, it it actually um, uh, gives a, a little bit more uh, juice in some cases um, when we use it in the racks. All right. So, so Andy, do you want to you want to talk a, a bit about you know the analogous? So, so what we've, what I've tried to present is is kind of some of the components and um, and the details of how we you know build up a um, a hardware a hardware stack. Um, do we want to talk a bit about the um, the software that uh, that then so now now goes in reverse? Right. Let's go sure. further up the stack. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course, and. Um, you know, we always each of us looks at it from a different perspective. So from the software folks, it's just, oh, just give us some hardware. That's the easy bit. And the hardware folks think, oh, the software, that's the easy bit that runs on top. But it's kind of where they come together that actually is kind of where the magic happens. And, and that's what's so exciting about what we're doing here. And, and, and you see that um, you know, in, in this, uh, this chart here, um, you know, it all starts with lifecycle management, right? And what is that experience when you first start to use a sesame rack um you know we've put a lot of effort into working together so that when you get that rack delivered everything is pre-configured um this all the software you need is located on the management node so we can deploy to the rack in a matter of a few minutes um we know what what servers are there um and you know we don't have to pull down all of the all of the images so this one enables us to do literally a single command to provision the rack how you want. Now, you know, there may be some configuration options you want to set to adjust how it integrates with your network or things like that, but essentially everything is there within the rack. Um, and not just a deploy time, but when there are updates, the whole stack is designed to be able to take updates automatically, deploy them into the rack, and do rolling upgrades across the cluster. So, you know, that's super important from a, an operational perspective and just a, a kind of time to value. Uh, you don't have to think about assembling a whole set of components for networking and storage and monitoring and the, the actual Kubernetes piece itself and the operating system and security patches and all of that. It's all just automated and streamlined. So that's a lot of value right there. Um, the, uh, the next la layer up kind of from the hardware, uh, we, we build the system around the Flatcar container Linux uh, operating system has a, a lot of advantages for systems like this. So it's um, it's optimized not just for running containers. So it's it is a, a minimal distro. So it just has what you need for running containers. Uh, but we've also uh, you know tested and qualified and verified it on the Sesame hardware. So you you know that it's going to work and it's going to keep working. Um, it's also a very secure base as well. So. Uh, the fact that you're running everything within containers means that you can think of the operating system as, as an immutable thing that only ever gets updated when you do a full OS update. You switch from the base partition that's currently running to an update partition. If that upgrade doesn't work, you switch back. Um, but you don't have to worry about package management. You don't have to worry about security vectors where uh, malicious actors actually modify the operating system on disk 
all of that's protected. So it's a it's a it's basically a, the, the the best basis as a, from an OS perspective for running cloud native workloads. Then onto that we deploy uh, Kubernetes, where the the core of the Kubernetes experience is just vanilla upstream. There's no special distro version here with modified pieces. This is the open source community uh, Kubernetes. But on top of that, then we have a curated set of components that we deploy. So for networking, for storage, uh, for monitoring, etc. Um, and those components, it's it's not just that we select the the right components to deploy that they all work together. We test them. We give you um, defaults out of the box. So you rarely have to think about what are all of the configuration options I need to get these things working together. Um, that's all set up by the installer and by default by the locomotive infrastructure. Um, part of those components are, um, are for monitoring and telemetry. So there's uh, Prometheus with dashboards and you can see what's going on. Uh, from the top of the stack through to some some of the hardware monitoring pieces as well, all in one dashboard. Um, and then at the very top level, you have a management UI uh, where there's a, you know, a, a clean, extensible UI from seeing what's happening within the cluster, which nodes there are, what pods are running. Um, and we're increasingly building this out with more and more um, capabilities in terms of what we call systems intelligence. So starting with um, uh, plugins based on a technology called eBPF to do things like uh, trace monitoring of syscalls that your applications are uh, performing. So uh, it even stores these on disk out of a ring buffer from the kernel. So in the event that something crashes, you can say what was happening up to the point that crashes helps you diagnose and debug things happening in your cluster. And, um, and also uh, identifying where you can enhance security. So for example, uh, defining network policies, it, it can listen out to the network traffic that's happening and then suggest network policies for you to apply into the cluster to further increase your security. So that's kind of the, the layers of the stack. And I, I guess the, you know, the key point here is everything here is 100% open source, 100% community driven. Um, you know, there's no proprietary pieces we're trying to uh, get in in some kind of layer here. Uh, and uh, what Kinfolk brings is you know, both development, but also curating of this stack and updates and making those updates available in an automatic way, which you know, is, is not just a day zero and a day one issue, but it's the day two and, and thereafter, and really thinking about that full life cycle of um, the experience you're going to have with this software deployment. Right. Yeah, Andy, and, and that that uh, that that day two uh, and day n, right, is is really um, the most important part of of all of this, right? Is that the um, you know the experience that that we've been optimizing um, together with Kinvoke for um, you know sixty minutes from from truck to workload, right? So the um, that, that's an analogy I often give or a, a focus I often give for our customers that we can deliver a rack on um, sort of a, a week's uh, lead time. And then um, once it arrives on the truck, um, it's fully cabled, fully integrated. And so we can roll it right into the data center, plug it into the, the floor for power, um, the wall for, uh, for networking and be running uh, workload 60 or 90 minutes later. And, and one key to that is also the, the, the pre-qualification and the, the implementation of that software infrastructure so that there's not suddenly surprises. Oh, the, the network driver or um, this cable doesn't plug into this connector, um, which can often lead to you know, weeks or, or more um, of delay, sort of days and weeks of, of delay, right? And then the, right. the the last part, um, you know, to point out in in that vein is that you know the install time, the setup time, you know, if if it's sixty minutes or or ninety minutes, is is only a small fraction of the uh, of the lifetime um, of that system, right? The the most important thing is that it's it's going to spend uh, many years um, running workload. And um, as much as we go back and forth about you know, software uh, versus hardware, um, Andy, all we've talked about here is infrastructure level, right? And the real you know, heroes or the real uh, people doing the work uh, here are the application developers who, since we're taking care of hardware infrastructure, software infrastructure, they're able to worry about 
you know, mobile applications, web applications, APIs, databases, you know, all the things that, that really make, uh, make computing work um, because we're taking care of the, um, the plumbing of, of both the hardware and the, uh, and the software. Absolutely, right? yeah. I mean, I, an, another way of putting what we're trying to do here, Eric, is to say, we're trying to deliver an experience which is as close as possible to a managed Kubernetes service, but you get it on-prem and you own the whole stack and it's open. And you know, that allows you and your developers to focus on what's running on top of that infrastructure stack. You should not be spending time worrying about you know, which, which version of my networking plugin or have I got, or um, which version of my storage plugin am I, am I running? Just let us keep that up to date. Um, let us make sure that it works to, with software together with hardware you focus on the application that's getting deployed and everything that's around that because that's that's enough of a job. That's a full-time job. Right, right. And then similar for us, right? So so we also don't want anyone to have to worry about the difference between RJ45 and SFP and QSFP and, and all the other uh, protocols that are and, and standards um, that are at the hardware level. Um, we'll, we'll take care of that um, in, our, in our qualification labs um, and in our production facilities. Right. So then the, the last piece that I want to uh, get to is, is what we advertise at the front. So the carbon footprint. Right. And so, so the next visual um, that I put up um, is, um, is specific to the, the carbon footprint of, uh, of this equipment. Right. And, and we've now um, laid in all the pieces that, um, that make this, uh, this picture relevant. Right. So what we've done um, in our hardware designs and with the open compute community is we've made the systems when they're running as efficient as possible, right? Low PUE, high density, high translation of, of electrons into useful work, right? We've made the, the software infrastructure as efficient as it can be, right? Um, streamlined uh, operating system, containers, orchestration, monitoring, looking for, you know, things that are, that are out of whack or, or using a, an unnecessary uh, set of resources, kind of optimized resources, right? So, so the infrastructure has done all it can to, to make the system as efficient as possible, remove waste, um, if you will, um, waste in the hardware design, waste in the, um, in the software layers, right? But at the end of the day, um, we're still going to have a carbon footprint. And, and then there's one more aspect that, um, that the IT Renew approach, uh, the Sesame approach brings to the picture, which is illustrated here. And, and so what we're showing in this chart is on, on the left-hand side, a sense of um, in the past year, the total number of, um, of new servers um, that were delivered um, in, um, in, in 2020, right? 46 million servers which can constitute over 3 million tons uh, of, t of uh, CO2 equivalents and over 6 million cars that were added to the road, right? And, and as we know, you know, the pandemic uh, caused an increase in, in computing demand and so also an increase in, in computing production, right? To the extent that we have delays and, um, uh, and so on, hiccups in the supply chain, but the, the numbers for, uh, for 2021 will be even significantly larger uh, than this, right? So very large carbon footprint, right? And so what we're showing on the right-hand side um, is a, um, a nine-year um, CO2 equivalent comparison of a traditional model on the, on the right-hand side with the big blue bar and the big orange bar versus um, a Sesame model. And what we're doing is we're saving um, in two ways, right? And one, um, we're reducing the operational footprint and that's the efficiencies that we've just been talking about, right? The efficiencies of, of open compute design, the efficiencies in the data center, some efficiencies in, in software and so on, right? So the operational phase, the power that is used by the systems while they are running is the orange bar. And, and that's being reduced by being more efficient in the way that we design and, and build the systems, right? But that still leaves the, the, uh, the energy that's being expended in what is here called the pre-use phase. So what we re also refer to as the embodied energy um, of those servers, right? So all of those servers, all the components, the highly integrated uh, CPUs, the integrated memories, you know, networking interfaces, super dense, super complicated technology has to be um, fabricated with processes that are both energy intensive, um, water intensive in a lot of cases, um, 
not people intensive because we've automated a lot of it, but the robots again need to be fed with um, with electrons and and water, right? And so what we show on the right hand side in kind of the standard today uh, system is we show a customer that refreshes their hardware um, every three years. And so that means there is a, a pre-use burden an embodied energy burden every time um, they install new hardware uh, in the system. So what we do with IT Renew is um, for the last um, 18 years, we've been in the business of, of decommissioning data center equipment and helping companies like the largest hyperscalers, um, including Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Uber, Dropbox, uh, kind of a, a general who's who of, uh, of the hyperscale business. And we help them extend the life of their equipment and then um, when they are done with it, then we create secondary and, and sometimes third um, uses um, for that equipment to reduce the blue bars. So we're squeezing out the pre-use by not building new servers. So if we're able to, to take a set of servers that are uh, coming off the line from an existing uh, hyperscale customer um, and extend their life years four through six, often the, the sweet spot, but years seven through nine can also be um, be helpful to reducing the footprint, then um, we're able to, to do a massive savings that um, is um, additive to the savings that we do in the orange bar, right? So the orange bar savings remain. If we're more efficient with the electrons, more efficient with, um, with the infrastructure, more efficient with, with the applications, of course, um, right? Also um, think of the, uh, the algorithms, right? Um, o log N rather than O of N, um, it's still important ultimately, um, but we're able to provide an efficiency at the, um, at the hardware layer. Um, so that um, is, a, is a super powerful um, kind of innovation um, that, uh, that we're bringing uh, to the marketplace um, for our customers today. Andy, any, any commentary to, uh, to wrap us up or about the, the footprint on the software? No, side? I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think it's, it's increasingly a concern for companies across every industry like what is their what is their environmental footprint and at the same time digitalization uh, is increasing and is increasing concern across every industry so it's kind of logical that they come together um, i think you know and the other thing that intersects with this is is cloud usage as well and if you know one of the things we're trying to do here is to enable customers to basically mix and match where they put their workloads. You know, in some cases, it'll make sense to put workloads in cloud. And that might be energy efficient in some scenarios, but you can put workloads on-prem in a data center that you rent um, using this kind of solution and get, you know, get better in many ways um, environmental footprint and also better um, from a, much better from a cost perspective as well. So um, what this does is it allows you, it's, it's another kind of tool in your toolbox to reduce the environmental footprint and you know, cost optimize at the same time. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andy, I, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't mention this up front, but probably for the, the Sesame product line at the moment, um, almost 50% of our customers are cloud service providers themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So the end users that are creating the applications, you know, running the, the servers and systems, they're um, renting this this infrastructure from the cloud service providers that are our customers. Right. Um, we also um, work with with some of the hyperscalers to, to self self recertify to self extend life extend um, their uh, their hardware. So the, the the footprint reduction that I'm talking about and the innovations uh, in the hardware space are accessible to to everyone. So so they're accessible to a, a small business, um, a medium uh, enterprise, um, a large enterprise that that already has an on premise footprint uh, for whatever reason. Um, as well as service providers of, of all shapes uh, and sizes uh, around the world. Yeah, and one of the things that having Kubernetes-based cloud-native software infrastructure here allows you to do is to do that workload placement either within you know, this rack or another rack and you know, on-prem in the cloud, uh, a mix and match where you do that workload placement for maximum efficiency. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, so hopefully, um, we've um, we've characterized kind of the the hardware interaction, the the software interaction. Um, it's a solution that uh, that the the two companies um, have worked on together. We're we're happy to to make that available to the marketplace. Um, so um, happy to to find us for additional details. Um, Robert, do we have uh, any any questions uh, based on our our session so far? Thanks, Eric. Uh, well, we have some questions here. Uh, I guess we'll start with you. Um, so Eric, do you expect to see the traditional hardware vendors joining the uh, Open Compute project? Oh, absolutely, Robert. So, so as I as I alluded to, you know, the Open Compute project is almost ten years old, and um, and we've seen participation across the board. So, um, you know, HP, um, Dell, um, other um, what you would term traditional vendors um, have been active participants and and throughout the uh, the system. Right? They they may not participate in all the tracks, but um, you know, different um, vendors decide on on different things that they're that they're sharing and that they're interested in. But but this the the benefits of the community um, have have really accrued um, even to um, you know to traditional players right. One way that you see it very specifically is there is now a standard for an OCP networking card that is used in um, in servers kind of across the industry because it was something that was just a kind of a no brainer for for everyone to do. Um, but absolutely, the the innovations have um, have also folded into to what would otherwise be considered um, proprietary products, just like it has with with Linux and and containers and so on. Okay, next question is for Andy. Uh, Andy, how do you manage uh, updates to the cloud native stack, specifically uh, your flat car container Linux and your your Kubernetes engine? Yeah, no, it's um, it's a great question, Robert. Because it's something we think a lot about. Um, you know, how do we do this in a secure way and a way that um, you know works operationally because people want to have control over updates and when they're applied. So we we actually have um, a, a product, an open it's an open source project, um, which is our update server, and uh, that that basically uh, allows each of the uh, hosts within the rack to query what is the latest version of the OS, and uh, you can apply policies on that update server as to how fast and um, how automatically you want those uh, hosts to update. And then that's coordinated between the OS and the Kubernetes layer. So when a new OS version goes out, which is uh, you know, fairly frequently because there are security updates from you know time to time, um, that's available then on the management node, and then each of the, each of the hosts within the rack, based on the policies you define for it, will just pick it up. Um, uh, it winds down the um, the workloads that are running on it. So because they're containers, you can do that. You call, it's called cordoning and draining the node in Kubernetes speak. Um, apply the new OS update and reboot. The um, the Kubernetes layer updates and the component layer updates are somewhat similar. Um, you know, there's it can be detected. You can go into the UI. It'll say, hey, this version is um, out of date. There's a new one. Do you want to apply? Or you can do it via a command line as well. So a lot of flexibility. And uh, you know, we try and automate as much as possible. OK, uh, I guess this next question, I'll, I'll, I'll throw both Eric to you and to Andy. Um, what are the key drivers your customers consider when choosing to deploy their own hardware infrastructure versus going straight to one of the public cloud service providers. Yeah, Robert, um, when, um, when we address this, I think the, the, the straightforward thing, right? So I, I've been working in, in high scale computing um, for my entire career and, and I've watched the evolution of, of the public clouds over the last 15 years. The, the, the real um, truth of the matter is that what the public cloud has allowed customers to do is separate out the different sets of concern. So we have customers that do all possible models that you could imagine between you know, on-premise infrastructure with proprietary software to public cloud with, uh, with shared uh, software. So we have customers that own their facilities but want to, to lease the hardware. Um, we have customers that um, 
uh, uh, buy their hardware and use managed services for the infrastructure layer. So they pay a company a monthly fee in order to uh, manage their, their software infrastructure. And so then they, they pay um, only their developers. They don't pay an infrastructure company. So what, what cloud has really allowed um, customers to do is a la carte, which pieces are are kind of critical for them and which pieces can be outsourced and converted into a monthly fee. And so the public cloud converts it into an all-in monthly fee that includes in development of the hardware, deployment of the hardware, development of the infrastructure, deployment of the infrastructure. But we have customers that um, that do every um, every piece in between. So it really isn't a question of do I do on-premise or do I do cloud? The important thing is something Andy said um, in the main part of the session, which is I design my applications as a set of, of services or, or microservices, a set of infrastructure to a common set of, of APIs, a common set of paradigms. And then I'm able to um, run that application on top of whichever infrastructure makes the most sense. And I'm able to float that infrastructure on top of whatever hardware makes sense. And so we have customers that are 20% um, public cloud. We have customers that are 80% public cloud, but there is whenever there is a need um, for on-premise hardware, then IT Renew um, can step in. And of course, the um, the software stacks like uh, Kubernetes and, and Flatcar and Locomotive are applicable, whether it's on-prem or uh, public. Andy, do you want to add to that? Yeah, one? yeah no, I, I think it's a great answer. I mean, the the, this idea that um, cloud is both a um, you know both a pricing model as well as a separation of operational concerns um, that's kind of the innovation that it, that it brought and a lot of those things can be applied into on-prem as well and that's one of the things which, that we've been trying to do is to enable that operational concern uh, as we were saying in the main session um, you know, we don't want you to worry about spending a lot of time managing the infrastructure. Now, if I can, if I can take away a lot of that effort from you, um, maybe we can make it as easy, almost as easy to have hardware on-prem as it is to consume just virtual machines in cloud. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, Eric, can you comment on the um, typical timeframes for the hardware operational phase you see with your customers? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Robert. So, so the the most important thing is there is no such thing as typical. So, um, we we absolutely um, have customers that are that are focused on, um, you know, Im improving their infrastructure, increasing their infrastructure, kind of getting squeezing out uh, a last bit of efficiency. Um, most recently, for example, in um, in AI type of workloads where there really is still a Moore's law of, of innovation, right? Where a, a piece of hardware um, that was just announced uh, last week um, at uh, at a GPU event um, is a factor of two and, and three more powerful than uh, than the system um, just uh, 18 months ago, right? Um, but there is also kind of a, a typical heavy weight of or heavy center centroid of computing where um, where Moore's law isn't uh, advancing um, as as efficiently as it was. And then there's also a, a set of of what are often considered secondary use cases in in storage and um, and, and other aspects of of the infrastructure um, where where the the laws have have always been different. Right, so so Kreider's law in, in storage was always a very different one than uh, than Moore's law, and so as a result, um, when once you think about which workload is being applied to to which hardware, and um, and what are the the life cycles of the various hardware, you find that there is no clean clean distinction. There's there are some drivers at three years because of financial reasons. But when you look at, you know, there are customers that will have storage systems in place for six, seven, eight years, because that's that's where the data lives, and and the data maybe maybe isn't growing, or maybe it is growing, and and they're very comfortable um, with those systems and APIs. And on the other extreme, there are um, you know, compute um, maybe a GPU type workloads where there's a turnover in in sixteen or eighteen months. Right, and then in between maybe is is networking, right? So there we still have customers today where we're bringing them from the um, the one gigabit um, era um, into 25 gigabit, right? And at the other end of the spectrum, we have customers that are starting to deploy 200 gigabit and 400 gigabit solutions, right? So the most important thing 
um, uh, Robert and and for for customer or for folks on the um, on the webinar here, is there is no typical, and what what the systems that we've described allow you to optimize within whatever your time frames are. If if your time frame is three years, if your time frame is two years, if your time frame is seven or eight years, the important thing is that that we can look at the the optimization um, across workloads across on-premise, across um, public cloud, as, um, as Andy um, has alluded to, and get the most efficiency um, across the board, right? And it's all enabled because we're collaborating and sharing on the, the lingua franca of the, the APIs and the workloads and the deployments. Okay, last question. Um, I guess I'll, I'll throw it to both of you. Um, are you. Are you seeing a changing mindset uh, with regards to how organizations are uh, addressing sustainability? Andy, do you want to take a start? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think um, it's it's definitely coming front and center, um, you know, and I, interestingly, I, so I moved from the States to Europe two years ago, and, you know, the, the U.S. two years ago was, um, not necessarily at the forefront of uh, concern about climate change and moving into Europe. It, it definitely, um, you know, you saw a lot more political, um, uh, you know, political tailwind for uh, pushing for climate change regulation. And I think, you know, companies are aware of that and are, are certainly um, you know, having an eye on what regulation is coming. As much as anything, actually, I think what's, uh, you're seeing generational change pushing it. You know, companies have uh, people coming into the workforce who they want, you know, the new employees want to work for companies that are doing good for the world, good for the environment, um, you know, for the millennial generation. These are important topics and we, I see companies responding to, um, you know, demands from, from their employees, from their communities um, to be more uh, proactive in these areas, and you see this with, for example, um, you know the the net zero the net zero commitments by companies like Microsoft, by Amazon, um, and also in uh, European countries which are um, committing to have you know, zero uh, traditional fuel vehicles by 2030. You know these are the kind of um, things that are, are really pushing forward uh, environmental awareness. So. I, having said that, I mean, I think it, it is just one of many factors still. Um, overall cost is, you know, is still the a key driver for compute infrastructure. But from what I see, I think, you know, the, uh, we can make this a win-win, right? If we're doing well by the environment, we can also make, uh, make solutions that uh, cost less. And, um, you know, those two, if we can, make them go hand in hand, then uh, it's it's good for everyone. Right, yeah, so so speaking from my perspective, I think the first perspective I should bring, so so speaking as an engineer, right, the, the politics of sustainability is only catching up with the, the, the scientific reality, right? So the, if we are inefficient in our use of, of the resources, then we will use um, more resources, right? And, and that's been kind of a, a, a focus of, of mine uh, in, in my entire engineering career, right? We always try to create the, the, the most efficient uh, solution to a particular problem, right? And, and so that's how I've approached, you know, the designs that we do in OCP, the designs that we use for power consumption and so on, um, don't waste the resources if we don't have to. Right, get a, a given amount of work for for less um, kind of inputs. Whether those inputs are, you know, electrons in in energy or uh, rare earth metals or and um, et cetera, water um, in some of the processes. Right. So so as an engineer, I've always been up uh, focused on optimizing the processes and and doing the same with um, with less uh, less input materials. Right. So in some sense, um, that's really we're really just bringing all that together at the level of a rack or at the level of uh, of a data center. 
right? And that said, um, as, as Andy said, there is certainly a drive with, um, with employees at companies, but also companies that are just now do starting to do the accounting. What is our footprint? Um, and as soon as you, you look at the numbers, um, then you realize, hey, our footprint could be smaller, right? Where, where is the waste? Where is the, um, the return on investment for reducing that waste? And that's the most important thing in, in our solution is that when a customer buys into a, a sesame rack, it is um, more efficient um, without compromise. So it's not, oh, you're paying more um, for the system, um, but uh, it's sustainable on the back end. It's actually paying less. So our customers typically pay between a 30% to 50% um, less than, than using a traditional solution and um, it has the sustainability benefit. So we think with, with those kinds of innovations that are, um, as Andy said, a win-win or a no-brainer, um, just, uh, just do it this way um, because it's, um, it's more efficient and um, it reduces the, the impact on the environment. Okay, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you, Eric and Andy. A big thanks to the good folks at CNCF and thank you, for joining us on this webinar. Thank you, Robert. Bye everybody, thanks Robert.